There was a time when, through science, we believed that the cell was the smallest thing, the building block of life. New discoveries led to the realization that the cell wasn't in fact the smallest thing. Instead, the molecule was. Now the molecule was the fundamental building block of life. But then new discoveries revealed that it wasn't the molecule either. The molecules were made of atoms. Now the atom was the smallest thing that you could get. Then you guessed it, we discovered even smaller things. Now we have subatomic particles and they are the most fundamental building block of all reality. Oh, okay, hold on. Now scientists are throwing around something called string theory, which is like vibrating noodles in hyperspace, smaller than all of that other stuff. Okay, so maybe it does get smaller. It makes me smile. If there's anything we know for sure, it ought to be that there's always going to be something more or less as the case may be. With all of our mathematics, brilliant scientists and ever evolving understanding, we can look and look forever, but we won't be finding a bottom anytime soon. So why are we looking? What is science for? Is it just to know? Why does it even matter? Why should it matter to you? What difference does it make whether atoms or cells or vibrating noodles are the smallest thing? Perhaps it's because our level of understanding directly relates to the level of reality that we have control over, which I suppose could be a very good thing or a very bad thing, huh? We'll get into that a little later because this video is about light. Why light? That seems pretty simple, doesn't it? It's what powers the earth. It's what powers me, you, everything around us. What if we could know the shape of light? its most basic characteristics, its smallest building blocks. What if we could understand the fundamental geometry and movement that light moved by? What if it was a three-dimensional solid form that we could map as simple as a tetrahedron or a cube? Would that change our understanding of reality? You know, I think that's what scientists and maybe all of us at some level are searching for. That one thing that might just allow us to create our own self-sustained ball of light. That one thing that connects everything. What if we could know that, the core building block of life and everything as we know it? Would it change our understanding of what light is? Well, let's put on our science hats and see what we can find out. Einstein said something amazing, something which has echoed through the halls of science since his death. He said that science should be simple, something that anyone can understand. Anyone can make things complicated and complex, but it takes a genius to make something simple. While doing research on Wikipedia, you find pages upon pages with bajillions of words describing these crazy formulas revealing the secrets of the universe, everything we know in modern science. Upon seeing these pages, it led me to ask a whole number of questions about what I was looking at. Questions like, why do we believe that light is what it is? What even is light? What is particle physics? Why is it relevant to me? Why is it that for the average Joe, these ideas about existence and reality are so hard to understand? Do scientists make them overly complex for a reason? Why are we having trouble following Einstein's brilliant words about simplicity? Is there a way that we can use sacred geometry to explain and simplify these ideas in a way that works and makes sense? And most importantly, how can I use this information in a way to grow as a person? I don't just want to build up beliefs about these topics, I want to expand my ability to create with them. And how do we do that? Where do we start? Well, let's start at the beginning. It's theorized across the board from creation myths, the basic geometry of the flower of life, and even in the big bang theory, that light is among the first things created at the beginning of everything. So exploring discovering how light works would be a fundamental piece to understanding everything. Let's take a look at particle physics and quantum physics. They may help us crack this code. Particle physics is the study of the basic building blocks of matter and the forces they exert on each other. In particle physics, scientists are trying to find the one, the one thing that creates everything else, or at least the phenomenon that they are observing. It is very closely related to quantum physics, which is using that same idea to discover the source of the universe we live in that ties everything together. 
Scientists in this field have done a lot of work in demonstrating and exploring the unified field theory, which shows that everything in the universe is connected through an infinite web of something. They're not sure what it is, but we can see how we are connected in a grand and mysterious way. As our sciences have looked smaller and smaller to find the smallest particle, we have reached a point where things get so small that we can no longer define what they look like. We try and define what particles are through abstract concepts and mathematics because we say that particles are unseeable and unknowable. And yet, things are always going to get smaller and smaller. Everything is made of something else, and it fractals down to infinity or it fractals larger to infinity. Some scientists have actually been known to cut infinite numbers when they find them because they're deliberately looking for finiteness instead of embracing the infinite nature of reality. Check out the movie Black Hole to see this happening in action. Particles are called particles because they're too small to be seen by instruments we have in science at this time. What that means is that we don't really know what particles even are. If we knew what they were, they would not be particles anymore. They would be described. There is kind of a broken dichotomy that is happening in this field. It's something that scientists all over the world are trying to figure out. Here's the problem. Light and other particles that move at the speed of light are assumed to have no mass. The speed of light, also known as the speed of massless particles, is about 299,792,458 meters per second. What we know in the field of science is that there's something that translates these particles from one side of the equation to the other, from the world of no mass and into the world of mass. If you ask the scientists this question, they would tell you that it's the Higgs field, the ever permeating field that gives things mass. In essence, light speed particles pass through the Higgs field and slow down and gain a property of mass. The popular Higgs boson is the particle that is created upon the light speed particle merging with the Higgs field. According to our formulas, this boson, this particle, is supposed to come out with it. I think there's an important piece of information that we're missing here, and it starts with asking some questions. First of all, what even is mass? And second, why do we believe that light has no mass? On Wikipedia, mass is said to represent an amount of matter, but then it goes on to say that the term matter has no universally agreed upon definition. How can we say that light has no mass when we can't even agree upon a definition or understanding of what matter and subsequently mass even are? Because of all of our fancy equations as described earlier, we have kind of thrown all ideas about what light could actually look like out the window in favor of a complex equation that looks like this. I wanna take it back to simple. What if we could know the shape of light? What if we could actually define what the structure of light as well as every particle and thing in existence were? What if there was a basic geometry of the universe that we missed? Even more interesting, what if light was a geometric solid and there was no difference between the geometry of light and the simplest particle? What if mass and no mass was not just about the speed that it traveled, but also the density of the information held within the shape? Maybe the speed of the particle is interdependent upon the information that was carried in the form. And the more information it holds, the denser it becomes. I have a few examples to demonstrate what I'm talking about. The first is water vapor. I know that it's not a light speed particle, but perhaps they have the same properties. See, water has a heavy density, but when it heats up, it translates into vapor and rises into the air. It takes a 90 degree turn into another dimension of form and it merges together with itself to become clouds. As the clouds become packed, denser and denser, with so much information packed within them, eventually they have no choice but to release, and all of the water comes pouring down. It's changing from a high-speed particle into a denser one, based on the density of the information within the droplet, as well as the speed that it was traveling. Now, I recognize that this only partially works as an example, because the particles I was describing are not light-speed particles. But if we can take that idea and apply it to light, it seems to work in a very similar way. Let's think about photosynthesis. A burst of energy from the sun travels towards the earth as both a wave and a particle. It has properties of both, and it's moving at the speed of light and passes through a plant. That plant then absorbs the information and energy that it needed from the wave particle that passed through it. The plant then uses that information, the light speed particles that it took from the sunlight, and uses it to create something with mass. 
merging them with water and other plant matter to create sugars and other nutrients. In addition to supporting the theory of light being a solid and holding information, and even mass, doesn't that also seem to fit the model of the Higgs boson too? I, I could be wrong, it's just an idea. If light is a solid, it can be both a wave and a particle simultaneously. If light is a solid, it can have both density or nothing inside it at all. And if light is a solid, well, what could it look like? What my friends and I have come up with is a combination of three forms, the three simplest shapes in existence. And as you look at it, ask yourself, can we simplify it further? Light is composed of two primary forces. We call these electricity and magnetism, thus electromagnetic waves and radiation. Electricity is particles and magnetism is waves. Remember everything we've talked about with male and female energy? Electricity is male. Magnetics are female. Curves and points, both of which are found on this shape. Looking at the flower of life, which is the blueprints for life and reality itself, you can see that's exactly how it works. You have male energy, the particles, the dots, and female energy, the waves, the curves. Now, you might notice inside the flower of life, there are two ways you can look at it. You can see the circles, lots and lots of circles, that make up the whole image. This is the female perspective. You can also choose to see this, this little shape that looks like a seed, which makes up the entire picture from these seeds aligning themselves perfectly with each other in beautiful six-fold symmetry. This is the male perspective. This seed is called the Trion Ray, as coined by the man who found it, Michael Evans. He is a man who has given a large part of his life to exploring sacred geometry and quantum physics. And quite honestly, his discoveries are evolutionary. The flower of life in two dimensions is a flat 2D representation of the way that the universe fits together in higher frequencies and higher dimensions. Michael saw this and asked a big question. If this is the universe from a 2D perspective, what would it look like in three? So he began modeling and molding three-dimensional flower of life together and discovered some pretty remarkable things. Everything has breath, everything breathes and everything lives. And so at a level of basic geometry of particle physics, we too must have breath. He found that every geometry we think we know of is a static and fixed perspective of what it really is. Tetrahedron? How about a tetrine and a tetrex? An inhale and an exhale of this basic form. Icosahedron? Here's an icosatrine and an icosatrex. He developed breathing models for all of the platonic solids. And then he found a new solid, one that hadn't been discovered before. Energy never travels in straight lines. It always moves in curves. By incorporating curves into the basic geometry of our platonic solids, you actually discover much simpler particles that before we never knew existed. And so we come back to these three images. The first one, as you know, is the sphere. This is simply one of the simplest forms and the most female. It's all curve. It's not hard to see how this form is used in the creation of all things. Just look at a planet or a star or even an egg. Next, we have this one, the Trinity or the Trion Ray. I'd actually like to make a distinction here. The Trinity is three spheres put together like a Vesica Pisces. And the Trion Ray is 1 16th of the volume of that. In three dimensions, they both come out with three edges, three faces, and two points, smaller than any other shape. It's a single shape that contains both particles and waves. They're both equally important, and Michael Evans proposes that with this Trion theory, he has speculated that light could in fact be a solid. In fact, it's highly likely. This Trion Ray is the geometry of a straight line. For if you were to draw any of the platonic solids, you could replace all of the straight lines with a Trion Ray and you would get a diagram of both the inhale and the exhale of that platonic solid. The great artist Delacroix once said, it would be worthy to investigate whether straight lines exist only in our brains. The interesting thing about the Trion Ray and the Vesca Pisces is that they both have straight lines as well as curves. And it's just a matter of perspective. One of the most important pieces of information about all of these shapes though, is that this is how form comes into manifestation from a geometric perspective, from source, to the material world. The sphere is a ball, it's all curve. Upon adding a second sphere, you get the first edge. And so this is curves and edges. When you add the third sphere, you get the first points. And now you have curves, edges, and points all together in one shape. 
As you continue adding circles, you get more and more shapes and forms that begin to manifest, such as the platonic solids and, and everything else we know about. This is why the Vesica Pisces is so important. As you know, we've been looking at this for a long time and we're going to continue to. Over the past year, I've been learning that the Vesca Pisces is one of the most important keys for waking up and transformation on this planet. It is a model for bringing people together to create powerful change on this planet. As we grow together and make powerful connections with each other, it is our connections that begin to alter the way that we do things. We help each other refine our messages. It is asking each other questions that allows us to explore deeper into what something really means. And then with the newfound information that we gathered together, we can set off on a journey to change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, these three forms are what I believe to be the God particles. We have a male form, a female form, and a form of a merging together of both of them. The God particle is not a matter of scale. It is not a smallest thing like a Lego block, but rather the simplest geometry that we can conceive in this dimension. It is a geometry that makes up all manner of things, regardless of size and scale. Just look around you. Most seeds look like this. Most leaves look like this. Most fruits look like this. Eggs look like this. Sperm looks like this. It's practically impossible not to find examples of it everywhere. All we need to do is take a look.